Hello. Uh, so nice to nice to be here remotely. I I wish I could attend in person, uh, but hope to hope to visit you all there sometime in the near future. So yeah, me uh, ani. I'm Daniel Ehrenberg. Habait uh, Shelly uh, is Las Roquetas del Garraf in Europe. Uh, well, okay, I ran out of Hebrew that I remember from Hebrew school as a kid, so I have to use vowels now. Chavra uh, Shelly, my work, is uh, Egalia. So I work for this company called Egalia that um, we do embedded WebKit and Chromium development, like especially for resource constrained devices and working on multimedia and, and uh, graphics drivers, as well as many different web standards and JavaScript and WebAssembly. We work on both the standards and the implementation in browsers and Node.js. And so I wanted to talk to you today about some things going on in JavaScript in TC39. So TC39 is a community of ECMA with JavaScript developers, uh, JavaScript engine maintainers, so people who work on V8 or JavaScript core that make JavaScript work in, in browsers and Node.js. Also transpilers like Babel and TypeScript, uh, frameworks and libraries, uh, academics who study programming language design, and uh, Node.js collaborators, a number of them are in the committee, uh, some big websites and application platforms. Unfortunately, we don't have any Israeli companies. I hope that can change soon. Uh, and we, we work on this, we work on the JavaScript specification. So it's a big HTML file. I would not really recommend reading it from start to finish because it's, it's very long, but I like to read at different parts when you're curious about something and then eventually you get more of a feeling for the, for the language. The JavaScript specification is developed here in a, in a GitHub repository, like any open source project. We have issues and pull requests, and we also have meetings. So every two months, we meet for three days to discuss possible language changes. In pushing features forward, we seek consensus on proposal stage advancement. So on the right, you can see a bit from an agenda that we had. TC39's process for new language features goes through four stages. First, at stage one, an idea is under discussion. Uh, we're, we're talking about it in committee, but we haven't really decided whether we're, we're doing it yet, and maybe we don't even know exactly what it will look like. At stage two, we do want to do this idea. Uh, we have a first draft that the committee kind of likes. And at stage three, we have a pretty final draft. We've talked through everything we can talk through, and it's ready to go for uh, for our implementations. So before stage three, we might have some early implementations like in Babel or in polyfills. And after a proposal gets to stage three, more engines will say, okay, well, this is pretty stable. So I'm gonna put in the work to implement and maybe even ship the feature. At stage four, we have multiple implementations. We have uh, tests and it's ready to go into the standard. So, uh, just a note about going into the standard. At that point, we would merge it into the draft standard. So we would have a, a PR that we merge. And then every year we cut a new ES 2020, ES 2021. But I think merging it into the draft standard is sort of standard enough. So in TC39, we make decisions by consensus. We don't, we don't vote on what the language will be like. Instead, we try to seek consensus we, we really tried to work together to meet everyone's goals. So in committee, we're always asking when someone proposes stage advancement, does anyone object to the stage advancement? And objections have to be for, for a reason. The goal here is to listen to everyone engaging in the process. We're, we're not trying to choose one stakeholder who's the decider and another not. We don't have a benevolent dictator for life. Uh, and really try to go for a conservative default of not standardizing things that are not ready yet. So let's talk about some proposals that are going through the stage process. We have Bigot at stage four. So with numbers in JavaScript, if you have a number that's too big, it will simply overflow. Adding one to it gets the same number back. And this is because numbers aren't mathematical numbers, but instead 
IEEE 754 64 bit uh, binary floating point numbers. So that's a lot of words, but basically they're only 64 bits and they're power of two fractions. So with, uh, I'll come back to this later when we talk about decimal, but with big int, you can add an n suffix. And that means that instead of using a number, you're using a big int. And then these can accurately represent any integer. So you get, instead of two again, you get three as the last digit. And n obviously stands for big int, right? So this is shipping across many different browsers. Uh, basically, Safari, Safari has this in progress and in Node as well as in other engines, now that Edge is shipping uh, Chromium, it's there also. So I had to update this, this slide. So Egalia, we worked on the Bigint specification. We wrote the specification in some of the tests. So for stage four, we need uh, conformance tests that are shared between engines. These are in a test suite called Test 262. It's another open source project. Uh, we standardized BigInt in TC39. We pushed it through the, the TC39 process and implemented it in SpiderMonkey and, and JSC. And for private fields and methods, so uh, this is that hash private thing you might have heard about. Uh, hash at the beginning of the name means that it's only accessible inside the class. So this slide comes from a TC39 presentation because we have to discuss in committee, why does it make sense to add this, this feature and think about, is it worth it to add this feature? Because everything adds complexity. Private methods and fields are important because they give you something that you can only access inside the class. I mean, that's important because this way you can change how the class is defined without breaking people who, who use it. So you could think of it with the slogan, hash is the new underscore for strong encapsulation. You can use an underscore at the beginning of a name to signal that you shouldn't use it, uh, but you still can. Whereas with the hash, you would get a syntax error. So TypeScript private keyword is sort of the same way. It's TypeScript will complain, but you can, you know, get around it. Whereas hash, there's just no way to get around it. That's the, that's the design goal. And the reason is because certain big libraries, uh, encounter this problem where it's hard for them to evolve over time because people keep reaching into their internals and depending on it and too much code breaks if those change. So this inhibits evolution over time and makes it, makes it harder for these library and framework maintainers to make things better for you in the future. So because this was considered important, it's advanced to stage three, it's shipping in, uh, Private fields are shipping in, in Chrome and under development elsewhere. Everyone asks, why not use the private keyword? And I think it's, it's clear that, that if it were possible, that would be a good option to consider. But we just don't have that option, unfortunately. So in languages with types, when you see object.x, the way that works is when compiling the code, you check, does object, what's the type of object? Okay, then what fields does the object have? Then is X a public field or a private field? Uh, but JavaScript is dynamically typed. So we need to know whether it's a public or private access sort of early so that we can give you this, this syntax error and do the right access type. So we would need something not just at the usage, uh, not just at the definition point, but also at the usage point. So we thought that the cleanest way to do it would be to use the same syntax at both so that you remember. So that's why hash is part of the name. Uh, TC39 has been thinking about adding private fields for probably 20 years. And we've talked about a lot of alternatives and you know, I'm happy to discuss more alternatives, but I think we've sort of thought about each of the different categories. So stage two features, these are things that we want to do. We have a first draft, but there still is more, more work. So for decorators, decorators uh, let you annotate fields or classes or methods 
and they're commonly needed across frameworks. So th this slide is from another TC39 presentation explaining why decorators are needed. And decorators are only at stage two because we've considered a few different alternatives for the semantics, but we haven't yet settled on one that got consensus for consistency for, for both for implementation and for usability. We're, we're still iterating on this, unfortunately. I really hope we can find the, the uh, full answer soon. And finally, stage one features. These are earlier ideas under discussion and well, decimals at stage one. So that's what we'll talk about today. The problem is, like I was saying with numbers, if you have 0.1 and 0.2, you add them, well, you just don't get 0.3. You get this other thing. With decimal, uh, with big decimal or decimal 128, which I'll describe in a minute, you might just get the right answer uh, using M to ask for decimals rather than to ask for a number. So what's, what's wrong with numbers? They are these 64-bit floats. So floating point numbers have a, a sign, you know, either positive or negative. They have an exponent. Uh, it's kind of like scientific notation. So it's uh, two to a certain power, and the exponent tells you which power. And then a fraction, which is a base two, um, you know, like decimal point, one, zero, one. And so they're just not able to represent 0.1 or 0.2 because they don't, they don't, uh, you know, five doesn't divide two. You know, there's no, two doesn't divide five. There's no way to represent that at all. It's just like one third in base 10. The closest we can get is 0.3 repeating, but eventually we have to cut it off. So, the cool thing in JavaScript is we have this two precision method. So we can actually look at the whole representation of it. And that shows us that it has this extra stuff at the end because the, the engine just had to round. So some, some core sort of use cases, requirements for decimal. I think the case this comes up most in JavaScript is for human written quantities, like, like money or maybe a tax rate or something. Uh, and of course we can do this all with libraries or with calculations based on sense, but the, the hope is to make this easier to use correctly. People run into issues right now with, uh, with errors due to the difficulty of the current kind of manual ways to do things. So. We want to be able to represent typical quantities precisely, have arithmetic, rounding, serialization, uh, and to be able to display things to users. So we, you know, we could get by without decimal. The, uh, you could just do everything on the server side and have a thin client in JavaScript. I guess that's the traditional way. But now a lot of people have richer clients doing more local calculations or even server sides written in JavaScript with Node.js. So it seems, it seems relevant to have good support in JavaScript. The proposal here is to have new literal syntax with an M suffix and operator overloading. Uh, unfortunately, like with bigint, we just can't overload to JSON uh, because it, it would have compatibility issues, but two string works to, to convert it explicitly to a string and the, the decimal constructor would convert from a string to decimal. So that's serialization. For displaying to users, there's this really cool API called Intel number format, where you can give it a locale and a number of options and then format uh, a number. So the idea for decimal is that format would be overloaded for, for decimal. And you would also have two, a two locale string method. For rounding, we would have a round method. Uh, but the core question is the data model. Uh, there were three basic choices, fraction, big decimal, or decimal 128. For fractions, uh, you could represent anything exactly that's, that's rational. So we would have a numerator and a denominator, and they're both big ends. Rational seemed like a good feature to me to add to, to a language, but there's just a different feature. Python and Ruby have both fractions and decimal. 
uh, for some operations that make sense on, on decimals, but not really on fractions are, are part of the core use cases that I mentioned, like rounding to a certain base 10 precision with a rounding mode or printing it out as a string. You just present rationals in a different way because the denominator is not always a, a power of 10. So for fixed size decimal, this is used in a, a lot of different programming languages as well. Here we would round if there's not enough space. So maybe we'll have space for 34 digits. That's what the IEEE 754 eventually added uh, base 10 decimal support. And, uh, you know, it, it works. It's your, it seems like some orders of magnitude more ahead of what would come up in normal business calculations. We could, on the other hand, have arbitrary size decimal, where the number of digits grows with the number. The mantissa, this, this fractional part, would be a big in. But this still, this has some complexity when it comes to how to represent something like one third. Even if we can represent all decimals exactly, we can't, we can't represent the result of all arithmetic operations precisely. We could either cut it off or we could say, you have to use a division method. So these things are still under debate and we're still thinking about whether we should go with big decimal or decimal 128. So our plan here is to try both and to gather feedback, to implement both versions with documentation and polyfills and encourage people to try them out and collect feedback on this. Based on that feedback, come back to committee and propose something to for stage two. So uh, I hope this is an uh, interesting example. I'm uh, happy to go into more detail offline or if you, especially if you want to follow up later in DC39. We'd really appreciate help with this proposal and other proposals. If you're, whether you're interested in decimal or other things, whatever you want to happen in JavaScript might already have uh, people working on a proposal. So you can help out on these things if you want them to, to happen in a way that depends on where they are in TC39's process. If something's at stage zero or stage one, you can help determine use cases or help contribute to a very high level design. Once something's at stage two, the proposal's trying to work out all the details and also have some earlier implementations. When something's at stage three, it's it's time to implement in engines and tools, as well as to make good documentation for people to use it and add tests. At stage four, something, something's done. It's possible to participate in TC39 internationally. Uh, there are lots of participants who have English as a second language and who live outside the US. You know, I live in, in Europe, it's not all people in California. So you can join the meetings by video call and participate in, in GitHub. So most of the technical tasks don't really take place in TC39 meetings. In the meetings, we collect feedback and gather consensus. And sometimes we come to, to interesting new ideas, but a lot of the technical work happens on GitHub like discussion about the design, the specification text, drafting, documentation, tests, implementations. Engines are tend to be open source projects or the engines that I know about, the ones that are in browsers are, are open source. And so we really encourage non-members to contribute on GitHub where this work is all done in the open. There's, there's a little form to sign for intellectual property you can also read our meeting notes on GitHub. And member, you can join ECMA to take part in meetings and the consensus process. So, you know, there's, there's a fee, it, it works by organizations. So you don't generally join ECMA as an individual, but rather as a company or university. And the committee has been changing over time. So, Historically, we had one big Microsoft Word document. We talked in meetings at a mailing list and we had one big occasional specification. So there was a big gap be between each time we came out with a new standard. 
without stages. So historically, we uh, with this Microsoft Word document, it was occasionally put into a PDF, but now it's now it's the web, and now it's developed on GitHub. Uh, we also have a discourse instance where we encourage discussion. So in addition to talking on on GitHub repositories, you can you can have some more informal discussion here. We set up a code of conduct. So if there are any Conduct issues, please report them. This includes TC39's online spaces. And we've been developing more documentation about how we work for more people to get involved. This is a good place to, to learn. We have a new, new website, and we're trying to collect more evidence uh, with real scientific studies to, to guide our language design decision. We're considering this for the pipeline operator at the moment. So in this context, for decimal, we're aiming to be participatory, rigorous, and experience-driven. We really want to not just make decisions in the vacuum of a bunch of people sitting in an ivory tower, but really be engaging with all of you and understanding so, so that we can figure out the, the needs of all JavaScript developers. So that's why we want to prototype these multiple alternatives. We're also looking at proposals to generalize decimal so that in libraries, people could implement their own things like decimal. And this is all really early. Uh, so we, we could really use, use your help. To follow up, uh, you can go to the decimal proposal repository. There's a survey where It'd be great to hear more about decimal in, in your application, or if you don't need it, then that would also be great to hear. Uh, check out TC39's website to learn, to learn more and contact me and uh, toda raba.